Welcome everybody to Executive Director's Chat. We call this ED Chat. Today's topic is one of the most requested. Everybody wants to know, what do I do with my volunteers? So today we're gonna to talk about strategies for recruiting, training, and utilizing volunteers. If this is your first time here, everybody, if you can remain on mute, um, if you have a question, feel free to use the reaction button and that'll allow you to raise your hand. Or if you need to get my attention, just raise your hand but by using your hand. But if you remain on mute, that will help the quality of the recording. And we certainly appreciate it. This is being recorded. So you will get the recording within 48 hours. So you'll be, you'll be able to get the, all the notes and all the things that all the speakers said. So I would love for you to continue to be my guest speakers. Today we have some guest speakers, but I would love for any of you to be my executive director's featured speaker because you have conversations that you want to talk about, not just any conversations, topics that you know that other nonprofits are struggling with or they're having successes with. If you're an expert in the area, please email me at asimonstechsoup.org. And we always want to know what are some of the topics you want to hear. So as soon as you close your screen, there's going to be a survey that will pop up. Please fill out the survey. I think it's just three questions. Fill it out. If you're having any events, whether it's Zoom, invite us. We would love to come and speak and share what TechSoup has to offer. If you're having larger events, email Shannon Cherry at scherry at techsoup.org. I want to make a screenshot of that. scherry at techsoup.org. And we would love to... Uh, come to your event, be a sponsor, just let us know. So as I said today, excuse me, today we're going to talk about volunteers and I have two executive director feature speakers. We have Elizabeth People here with us today. She's the CEO of You Are Life, which focuses on the internal structure of nonprofits through development and strategic planning. While studying at the University of Central Florida, she received her BS in legal studies received her master's in public administration and graduate certificate in nonprofit management. She has 18 years experience in the legal field and over seven years in the nonprofit sector. And we also have Marilyn Donnellan. She is an author, a trainer, a coach, and author of more than 60 books, mind you. Study guides, toolkits, and training videos geared to nonprofits and NGOs in use in more than a dozen, a dozen countries. She's earned more than 35 years experience building the capacity and sustainability of all types of nonprofits. Marilyn and Elizabeth, I'm so glad you're here. Elizabeth, I'm gonna turn it over to you and allow you to share your screen and you can begin. And again, if you have a question for Elizabeth, write it down. At the end, Marilyn will come after Elizabeth and then you can ask your questions. Welcome, Elizabeth. Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. As long as I've been on Zoom, I still get some things messed up. <laughs> uh, so hello, everybody. Um, if you can see my screen, give me a thumbs up. All right, awesome. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. Um, I am the owner of UR Life Consulting. And today I'm gonna be talking to you all about uh, volunteers and using them in your end of year campaign or, or how you can use your end of year campaign to get volunteers, I should say. So we're going to start off with talking about our goal. And the goal is to use the end of year campaign to build a strong volunteer base of vetted individuals to work with the organization throughout the year. So we're not just talking about uh, people that individuals that are going to work with you on, uh, say, a one off, say, you know, a particular event or something, but trying to get volunteers that are going to stay with you throughout the entire year and long if necessary, uh, and help you continue do the continuous work in the community that you are trying to do. And so today we're going to go through a three-step process to reach this goal. And so step one, uh, just as an overview, we're going to go ahead and assess the organization. Step two, we're going to organize key factors for your volunteers. And step three, we're going to create campaigns to target the volunteers needed. So we're gonna start with the step one where we're gonna assess the needs of the organization and where the volunteers will best fit. So often we hear about organizations that have volunteers or, or actually we hear from volunteers that have worked with organizations and they weren't quite happy with the experience because they felt like 
they either weren't needed, um, you know, there were too many volunteers in one location, and they weren't needed, or they didn't have enough information for what they were supposed to do that day. Um, they didn't know who their contact person was. So sometimes just miscommunication can really um, make the experience not go over so well. So today we're going to break down how to have certain things in place so that that experience goes really well for your volunteers. So the first thing is deciding what type of volunteer you need. Is this going to be a long-term volunteer? And when we think about long-term volunteers, we want to think about uh, office workers. So if you need someone that needs to come into your brick and mortar organization building and do mailing or emails, you know, whatever that is around the office that you need them to do in a volunteer capacity. Um, we're looking at after school programs. Do we need volunteers to uh, come out at a certain time of the day, deal with a certain type of uh, students or target audience that we have? And of course, we think about mentors. Mentors are on 24 seven. There's very rarely a day off for mentors. So we definitely wanna make sure that if we're seeking out long-term volunteers, that not only do we know, not only do we make sure that they understand that they are long-term volunteers, but that the organization is set up in a way to uh, keep them going throughout the time that they're with you. Uh, we still have to remember to keep supporting the volunteers as they're working with you, especially when you have long-term volunteers. It's not enough to just at the beginning have their excitement and they're like, yay, we're ready. Um, and then halfway through three, three, four months down the line, they're feeling a little down. Like as the organization, you have to constantly pick them up. You have to constantly make sure that they are, you know, the wheels are going, the excitement is still there, that the passion is still there and that they still want to do the tasks that you ask them to come on and do. So then we do talk about short-term volunteers and this can be event or project-based when you're looking at a community day or a food giveaway. Um, this is when you have smaller tasks, things that are not, uh, don't need to be explained in a, in a wide, in a really big way. So say you're doing a food giveaway. It's you have a volunteer, you give them the supplies that they need, you know, hey, you guys are gonna have box one, two, and three. And as the people come in for the food, you need to make sure every person gets A, B, and C before they leave the, the building or the facility, right? That's pretty small, that's pretty easy to understand. So if that person comes on with you that morning, those instructions are really um, instructions that they can get at a moment's notice. But when you have a long-term volunteer, that's a little bit more, right? Um, and so even we look at uh, projects such as, you know, uh, having them come in to help hygiene packages for the homeless or packing uh, school supplies for a book bag drive. Uh, again, these are smaller um, volunteer, you know, these are short term volunteers with smaller tasks that we have them doing. Um, and then we look at professional volunteers. I hear often uh, organizations want to have those professionals kind of at their fingertips. However, they're not cultivating them or they're not understanding how to do that. So first things first, you need to understand what type of professional volunteer you need. Do you need counselors? Do you need mental health professionals? Maybe you need trainers or even financial experts, but you have to determine what that need is first so that you know what type of credentials you're looking for. You know to what level you need a volunteer. You may not need a financial expert that has 45 years under their belt. Uh, it may suffice that the person has five or 10 years under their belt. And that may change what their request is from the organization, whether it's, um, you know, the time that they give or things like that. So understanding what you need in that professional volunteer is going to make a big difference in being able to cultivate and get that volunteer on board. So now we want to go and we want to look at um, our second one. And here in this one, we're going to build a chart for our volunteers. Okay, so this is organizing key factors for the volunteers and we're going to build out a chart and we're going to add four columns to that chart very simple. Column number one is going to list the benefits of volunteering with the organization. So this is what you perceive the benefits for the volunteer uh, when they work with your organization right so this is all what we think you know, we think it's great, and <laughs> we know that. Um, but then column two, we want to list what are those benefits um, with that volunteer assisting the clients and community you serve, okay? Um, and you'll see as we get to the back, to the end of this, how it kind of outlines what the volunteer is going to be doing. In column three, we want to list takeaways or feedback that we've received from current or past volunteers. So this is going to take a little bit more work. If you have not been getting feedback from your current or past volunteers, you want to start now. You want to know what's their experience with working with you. What did they like? What did they dislike? Um, you know, you want to get that information because honestly, it's their experience and it's their side or their version of what it is like to work with your organization and or your clients. 
And so um, it's gonna be very different from your standpoint. So you wanna get that information. And in column four, we're gonna list the cons of working with the organization. We know nobody ever wants to say any bad, anything bad about it, right? But we have to understand that if we can acknowledge and we understand what some of the cons are with working with the organization, that helps you improve. Okay, because now you know the key factors that you need that the organization needs to focus on going forward to improve those things so that your volunteers in particular are um, having a great experience when they come on and they work with you. So that's our chart. We're gonna build out those four columns and use those four columns in creating our um, volunteer campaign. And so, excuse me, uh-oh. Um, step three, we're going to create the campaigns to target the volunteers that we need. So we just went through step two and we kind of outlined the different volunteers that we could have working with our organization. So now that we know what that is and we've decided short term, long term, professional, etc. Now we need to know how many do we need. We don't want to be in a situation where we have 20 volunteers, but in actuality, we only needed five. So now you have 15 people that have nothing to do and you have nothing to do for them, right? And so that's not gonna be a great experience for those 15 people that signed on and got there and there was nothing for them to do. Um, and they know when you're trying to cover it up. <laughs> we know when you're trying to give them menial tasks because you don't have anything outlined for them. And that's not really a good experience for that volunteer. And so we also wanna look at creating um, a user-friendly application process. Some people use application process, some people don't. I encourage an application process. It gives, it allows you to get certain information from that volunteer. It allows you to start building a rapport with that volunteer. And it also allows you to pick, to choose the best fit volunteer. Just because someone says, hey, I wanna volunteer, does not always mean that they're the best choice for the organization. So some of the ways you can do this is QR codes. That's really big now, uh, especially with the pandemic going on. You can just scan the QR code and everything populates right there on their phone in front of them. If you are promoting on your social media or your website using different links, is definitely going to help. Make sure the links are self, you know, the links can be self-explanatory where it can say your website backslash and volunteer sign up. Uh, you know, you want to make it as easy and as user-friendly as possible for the volunteers to know and understand what they're doing. If you're in a situation where a paper application is better, have it on hand. Some people still like paper and that's okay. Or maybe the event or the venue that you're at, a paper application is better. I always say, especially if you're doing a vending event and you're in a particular location, have a paper application as a backup because in certain places, the internet does not always work properly. And you don't wanna be in a situation where the QR code is not going through because they can't get a signal or those links, they can't click on them, but you have that paper application or brochure or something that you can give them that will help them understand, okay, yes, we like to do this. This is the information we need to know. We're ready to sign up and we can do it right here on the spot. Okay, if you give people too much time to decide, they may not come back. So you wanna see, you wanna be able to get them signed up while they're in the moment and they are thinking about doing it. Um, so then we're going to talk about starting when we're doing our campaign, we're going to start talk about starting with our existing people. So if you're already doing an end of year campaign, you don't necessarily need to change it, but I would, I would recommend adding a call to action for volunteers that meet your needs. Okay, so if you're already sending out your end of year campaign to your supporters, your donors, etc just add in this quick thing because those people already have a vested interest in your organization. They already support in another way. And this is just providing them one more way that they can volunteer with the organization. Um, we're looking at creating, uh, we're in the tech world, right? <laughs> Everything is tech now. So looking at creating a video, and this does not have to be a uh, professional video. Our cameras nowadays, our cell phones, I'm sorry, have cameras that are almost just as good as some of the professionals cameras. Right. And so, you know, take time to learn how to take video of certain things and use, you know, simple editing applications that can help you edit the video to make it look really nice. Again, this doesn't have to be over the top professional because it's the message that you that you want to be concerned about. And the message you want to include is that working, you know, volunteering with the organization is a great thing. So you can do quick 10 second videos of different volunteer um, activities that are going on, whether it's in your brick and mortar or it's out in the community doing things or it's uh, in the classroom, wherever those volunteers are, a quick 10 second video kind of merge them together to make one long, you know, 30 second or 60 second video. Boom, you have your video. 
put it out there, send it out to people and let them know, you know, what a great job your volunteers are doing and how they can come on and help you. If videos are not your thing, we can still do a written campaign, including information that you gathered in step number two, right? And also you wanna add in future projects. We always wanna let people know what's coming next so that they understand that you still have a need for volunteers. You know, I may watch your video and say, oh, well, they got plenty of volunteers. They don't need me. But those volunteers, I don't know if those volunteers are staying with you or not. You know, so you have to be able to um, show that there is a need for your organization to have more volunteers so that now that I'm watching and I'm going, wow, this is awesome. And then the last part, just to reiterate, send to your existing supporters, use them to bring in, use it also to bring in new ones, right? And then going from there. Uh oh. And my screen won't slide. <laughs> oh, there we go. So that wraps up my segment. Um, if you would like to contact me, um, here's my information. You can check, you know, my website, urlife.consulting. I'm on Facebook, Instagram. I also have a link tree. My link tree outlines on there. I have um, free to low cost services that organizations can, uh, you know, view or sign up for. Um, you can also meet, uh, email me or contact me by phone. Um, any questions? I wasn't really watching the chat, but do we have any questions, Ms. Aretha? No questions, great comments. Um, it, and in fact, if you wanna ask her a quick question, you can do that right quick. Anybody have a question, use the raise your hand option that would be helpful or raise your hand if you're on screen and I can see you. Okay, well, while Marilyn is, they'll probably have questions at the end, while Marilyn is getting her ready to share her screen, Elizabeth, you can stop sharing your screen. I'm gonna launch this quick poll. Um, do me a favor, fill out this quick poll and let me see how many how many volunteers you have. Is your organization completely run by volunteers? Is it mostly run by volunteers? You use volunteers for only events or other? This, you, you're not sure. A lot of organizations um, completely run by volunteers. I'll share at the end. Okay, mostly run by volunteers. Okay, I'm going to stop this in about 60 seconds. All right. Okay, I'm going to end this poll. So as you can see, volunteers is very important. You see the results. So there are a lot of people, your organization is completely run by volunteers. Even the executive director is a volunteer. So we get it. So I'm glad you're here today. Marilyn, you can go ahead and share your screen. And thank you so much for participating in that poll. While she's getting her screen up, again, if you have any questions, um, feel free to type in the chat room or you can wait to the end to ask questions. This is being recorded, so everybody will get the recording. Marilyn, over to you. Okay, great information, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. That was good. Um, I'm going to switch us to a little discussion about board development and recruitment. How many of you have a difficult time seeing your board members as volunteers? You shouldn't. They are your key volunteers. And too often we don't apply the same strategies to our boards in recruitment, training, recognition, and so on. So I'm gonna talk very briefly today about some keys to board development. And a lot of what I'm gonna say applies to virtually any type of volunteer. Um, speaking of which, a virtual volunteer, disabled volunteers, board members, committee members, et cetera. So there are four keys. First, you really need to take the time to develop recruitment policies and procedures so that you know how you're going to work with each type of volunteer. Secondly, you need to develop policies and procedures around orientation and training. You know, I have to tell you in the decades I've been doing this, I can really count on one hand the number of nonprofits I've worked with that have had good board training and orientation strategies. And this is absolutely essential. Your board members are legally liable for the decisions they make or do not make. So you need to have in place the right training mechanisms to make sure your board members understand their governance responsibilities. Thirdly, you need to have policies and procedures related to recognition. How do you support your volunteers and let them know how terrific they are 
and that includes board members. And fourth, policies and procedures related to dismissals. You mean you can fire board members? Yes, you can. And I'm gonna take just a minute to show you some ideas about that. But first, under recruitment, here are some ideas that I found are very helpful. Make sure your nomination process is very confidential. Now, one of the things I like to recommend that very few nonprofits think of is wrapping the entire board nomination process into your overall volunteer development by having a board level standing committee called volunteer development and you incorporate the nomination process into that so that the recruitment of your board members and other volunteers is a year round emphasis for you, not just scrambling for warm bodies, especially at the end of the year when the terms are up. Secondly, develop a matrix for identifying what types of board members you need. As Elizabeth said, this also applies to all types of volunteers, but especially for board members. The next thing are to develop the tools that you can use in board member recruitment, job descriptions, an application, conflict of interest, confidentiality, and commitment to serve forms. Now I like to wrap all of those three into one form to make it simpler, but you need to have these available. Board members are your best board recruiters. They know the community, they know the people in your community. So even if you as the executive director go along in recruiting board members, take a board member with you. It will really help in that recruitment. And don't forget succession planning. I call this the Mack truck theory of management. If you get hit by a Mack truck, who's gonna take over? And that applies to your key volunteers as well. That's why we have developed policies and procedures that can really help you to develop a good succession plan. Do you have term limits? I'm working with a client right now that's 20 years old as far as the nonprofit is concerned. And you know they do not have term limits and it's really creating problems because if you're not bringing new people in with new ideas, it can really stymie your ability to develop as an organization. So don't forget to have term limits. Finally, depending on the clients that you are working with, you may also need to do criminal background checks on your key volunteers, as well as your board members. Now let's look at training. The number one issue I see in dealing with nonprofits of all types and sizes is this issue of roles, responsibilities, and lines of authority. In other words, who's in charge? And it can get into all kinds of problems. So I'm going to very quickly run through this chart to show you what I mean. When a board member is serving in a governance role, the only staff person responsible to that board is the executive director. All other staff and volunteers are accountable to the executive director. If a board member then sits on a committee, there is no line of authority. The board member on that committee is advising staff and staff is advising the board members on that committee. The third hat or role a board member might play is that of a program volunteer either virtually, they could be a disabled volunteer, they could be a board member. These are your program volunteers. And in this role, you have assigned a specific staff person to be in authority over those volunteers. And sometimes we have this attitude, I know I did when I first started, that a board member speaks, I jump. But that's not necessarily the case. If they're speaking in a governance role as a body, yes. But if they are serving food at a soup kitchen, they are not in charge. The key staff person 
or even the lead volunteer is in charge. This little chart can really help you if you are having problems with toxic board members or volunteers that are overstepping their bounds. This is a key thing to include in your board training as well. Now let's talk very briefly about dismissal. This, I'll tell you, this is a workshop in itself. So I'm just gonna hit the highlights of it. There are two key areas and one is communication. You need to be sure that you can have open and honest communication with your board at all times. So that if there is a problem, you operate board member to board member. If that volunteer is a board member and is disruptive, have a board member speak to them, not you as the executive director, because the board member has that responsibility. Now think about it. If you have not experienced this as an ED, you probably will. And that is that boards will sometimes be more apt to fire the executive director if there's a problem than to fire a board member. And that's unfortunate. And that's usually because we do not have in place the proper policies and procedures for dealing with disruptive volunteers, be they board members, committee members, or program volunteers. So be sure that you develop policies and procedures related to dismissal policies that incorporate how you will communicate with them and how you will deal with disruptive volunteers. And don't forget, you may have to also change your bylaws on some of these things if you are changing how you do it. Okay, you do have lots of available website resources. On my website, um, I have a whole slew of training videos as well as books and free resources. So don't hesitate to read out, reach out to me if there's anything I might be able to do to help. Aretha, back to you. That was awesome. So a lot of us don't even think about our board members being volunteers and they really are. So there were some questions in the chat room, but if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, everybody's saying this is good info. Christine asked if there were handouts and Marilyn just gave you her info. Um, you can contact her and Elizabeth. I'm sure they have handouts on their website. Lily, I saw your handout um, hand up before you had a question. Um, Marilyn, we'll stop sharing your screen. And then April, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm wondering if um, either one of the two speakers recommend that you track your volunteers and what kind of way do they recommend tracking them? I've, I've heard that in applying for certain grants, you can use volunteer hours towards uh, the, the amount of money that you've, you've already raised for the project or, you know, it can help with getting grant seeking. And I just wondered if either of them have um, information about that. Yeah, I, I will take that if that's okay. Absolutely track your volunteer hours because you can regard those as gift in kind hours and it can often be a requirement of certain uh, grants. And one of the easiest way to do that if you have a website is have a password protected site where you have time log sheets where your volunteers can actually go in and enter their hours ahead of time and then your volunteer coordinator or volunteer de development director can then access that information. Very good. Jessica, April, did you have any other um, comments? Well, I was just wondering, um, I've heard that you can track the volunteer hours on your CRM. And I just wonder if anybody has experience with that or suggestions about that. That was what I was thinking about doing starting the beginning of the year. Yes, you can. You can. I mean, there's there's a way you you do that. Your CRM has it where you can type it in yourself. So absolutely. Um, Jessica, go ahead and unmute yourself. 
Great, thank you, Ms. Aretha. Um, so for, this is a question also for both pre presenters. Um, I have recently been appointed the interim executive director of a theater that has been fully volunteer run for 92 years. Um, no paid staff at all. So I don't have a volunteer coordinator and we really don't have uh, any kind of volunteer databases. Everybody just sort of pitched in, uh, which was a great thing. Uh, so how, uh, my first question is I'm wrestling with the board of directors on trying to explain to them that any volunteers, that that chart that you showed about, you know, the sort of the levels of authority, that none of the other volunteers should fall under the board of directors, that any other staff that we might hire are going to fall under me as executive director rather than the board. Um, what kind of resources can I share with the board to really make this clear? And then my secondary question, is if I have a volunteer volunteer coordinator, uh, they would still be reporting to me as the ED, right? Because they are a volunteer. So those are sort of my two questions about this. Yeah. Elizabeth, you want to take that or do you want me to take it? Um, I, I first of all, I want to say that's awesome. Uh, that you have all volunteers. Um, I was thinking about the second question you said as far as the volunteer coordinator falling under you. If everything is volunteer, then they do fall under you, but you know there can still be um, a, a outline of what level everybody is on and who they report to. So you can have it where um, not every single person directly reports to you, but you can have them to report to that volunteer coordinator. And then you and that person sit together and talk it out about what's going on with the rest of the volunteers. And that can kind of streamline uh, what needs to take place or what changes need to happen based on what they're saying. There will be some things the volunteer coordinator can handle on their own and you would be able to speak with them to decide what that is um, before they need to bring it to you. So um, to your second question, yes, they would fall underneath you, but there's a way you can set it up to where you're not having all, you know, 75 people come to you at one time so with their questions. <laughs> Is that helpful? Uh, Jessica, I have a question for you. Number one, has have your board members had any training about their governance responsibilities? No, we're going to. We just started the process of bringing in a training in January because I said, you, I literally, this has been a month I've been in this role. I said, oh my gosh, you don't have any onboarding for your board members, no training, nothing. Let's try and get this happening. So yes, we are getting to that. The second question is, do you have a strategic plan? Yes, yes. They, they made one just before I started. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> All right, good. Does that plan include volunteer development goals? No, it should, but no. And, and this gets to what I call the core elements of a successful nonprofit. Whether it's volunteer run or staff run, you still need to make sure that there are board level standing committees for six things, administration, board and volunteer development, marketing, programs, community involvement, and the sixth one just left my head. <laughs> but that was good. That was good. <laughs> that was thank good. you so much, both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So a lot of people are saying they're using Excel to track the volunteers. So th that's great. I mean, use, use what you have. So you can use Excel to track your volunteers. And someone asked uh, about recommending a good inexpensive board training program. Somebody said, check out joannegary.com, but you can also check out marilyndonnellan.com. Um, Google Forms, that's great. So a lot of, a lot of, this is what I love about ED Chat. Everybody gives suggestions and tools that they're using. Anyone else had a question for Elizabeth or Marilyn? Uh, I, I would say because the question was raised about board training, I do have a board training video on my website that you might want to take a look at. It can be used repeatedly over and over again. And it's a, a good way to train your volunteers. Thank you for saying that. And somebody mentioned Keela um, is a really interesting software. Just learned about it. And we do have Keela on um, TechSoup's website. As you know, um, TechSoup resources, they're usually 50 to, to 85% off. So. It's best to check the catalog in TechSoup. 
Um, Bri Brianna says, what's your top strategy recommendations, strategies or recommendations to recognize volunteers? I love that because volunteers need to be recognized. Um, both of you can answer. I'll start with um, you, Marilyn, since you're unmuted, and then Elizabeth. Would you repeat the question, please? The best or some of the top strategies or recommendations to recognize volunteers. Oh, I have to tell you one of the least expensive and most fun recognition ideas that I stumbled on by accident in about my third nonprofit was little sticky notes. If you go to the stationery store or a store like Staples, pick up some bright colored little post-it notes or sticky notes that say, you're awesome, you're fantastic, whatever, and just hand those out willy-nilly to make sure all the volunteers get recognized with one caveat, and that is keep track of who you've given those stickers to because you might inadvertently miss Susie Smith who just happens to work behind the scenes. So keep track of who you recognize, think creatively. One of my volunteers actually came up with one which I thought was funny. She said, every day we had a volunteer of the day and we put a blue ribbon on the coffee pot and said, Susie is our volunteer of the day. So everybody knew Susie was volunteer of the day. So little things like that. But I did have another volunteer who had been volunteering for like 30 years, who was livid when I tried to give him a plaque. He wanted the money go to the programs, not for a stupid plaque. So that means you have to have really good records that keeps track of what type of recognition does this volunteer appreciate and what type do they not appreciate? Uh, because that was my very first nonprofit. I was afraid I was going to lose my job over that one. All right, Elizabeth, you have any uh, suggestions or, or strategies or recommendations to recognize volunteers? Um, I agree. One of my biggest things is get to know people. Uh, so, you know, when I talked about vetting your individuals in that vetting process is where you can kind of find out what they appreciate. Um, and it can be things that you use throughout the time that they're there. It doesn't have to be a specific time where we are um, acknowledging volunteers. Um, we are in a tech age. If you have younger volunteers, understand that they are on their phones 90% of the time. Um, you can include some technical things, whether it's video or um, a chat. Uh, um, What's what I'm looking for? A text mess, a mass text message that goes out, um, TikTok videos that you can just post to say, you know, we love our volunteers. You can send them out in emails that are going out if you're acknowledging everyone. Specific volunteers, I love the sticky note volunteer idea. Um, I'm the type of person where I literally walk up to people and I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. We love what you do. I'm that person. I'm very in person. So if that's you, don't be afraid to approach a person and speak to them. And, and don't be scared to ask them those questions. How would you like to be acknowledged? We want to acknowledge you, but we want to do it in a fashion that you feel appreciated um, and have them tell you what that is. And, and like Miss Marilyn said, keep those records so that you're, you're, you don't have to ask them every single time. <laughs> you know, and then you can also, that's how you can build out strategies as far as how to recognize your volunteers. The more people you have that are on, on, you know, that like, say the sticky note idea, then we know that's a strategy we can plan out and make it more creative. Um, but if you don't know what they like, or if you don't know what they uh, uh, would take as appreciation, that makes it a little bit harder. Yeah. Marilyn and Elizabeth, would you both write your contact information in the chat room? People are asking for it. And a lot of people are have already, have already said they asked them what they would like, ask them what their love language is. I love that, um, Robin. So yeah, uh, Jessica saying, say, love the volunteers, love language. Yeah, I love that. And I love Mandy already put in the link for Amazon post-it notes that says you're awesome. See, this is what I love about this community. Thank you so much for doing that. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions or comments? It's great. And everybody's put it in sites. And a lot of times, if you don't see um, something immediately on TechSoup's website, type it in anyway, because a lot of times it's, I won't say a lot of times, oftentimes I find that it may not be there. It may not be on the website, but it may be in the product catalog. Like I found an Apple computer that wasn't in the catalog, but when I typed in Apple, it popped up. So make sure you always check with TechSoup before you 
you know, pay retail price for everything. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Okay, going once, going twice. Would you put one comment in the chat room? Okay, my first time here. I'm so glad, Adam. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting your website, changelifesoccer.com. Love that. Love that. Thank you guys so much. Put in, we are sharing the slides. We are sending the video out within 40 hours. Put one takeaway today. One thing that you learned today, put it in the chat room and let me know. And I know some of you have to leave. You have to leave as soon as you close the window, the survey will pop up. Let us know. Oh, a lot of first timers here today. Hope for you .org. Oh, almost like Elizabeth's website. Recognize volunteers. Dave says recognize volunteers. Hey, Dave Simmons, not Simons. <laughs> Kevin says line of authority. Yes. See, we didn't think about the board of directors. George says recognize volunteers as well. Kathy, track your volunteer hours. Very important. You can Google right now how much a volunteer hour is worth because that is very important. The last I checked, it was worth $27.20. So that's a lot of money. One hour was worth $27.20. So if you have a volunteer that volunteered 100 hours in, in you know a year, that's whatever. You do the math. I'm not good at math. I barely passed math in high school. But... Do them, I was, that was a laughable moment. Yeah, I'm just trying to break it up, lighten it up a little bit. But volunteer hours, they make a difference on your grants. Robert says, the video campaigns, I do love that too. I love that. Uh, add volunteer strategies to board planning. Yes, that was a good one. That, one, that was worth the price of free right there. Uh, Holly says, I love the video idea again. Sabrina, board training and development. Great, you're first time here. A lot of first timers. Very good, Jessica. Volunteer organization and authority. Yes, lines of authority. Volunteer hours. Wow, wow. Lots of takeaways today. Good. A lot of new first timers. Great. I'm so glad you guys are here. Again, if you register, you will get the video within 48 hours. I want to thank you all for being here. As I always say, while you're taking care of everybody else, please make sure you take care of yourself. Marilyn Donnelly. Thank you so much for your expertise. Elizabeth, people, you're making me smile. Thank you guys both so much. I appreciate you guys. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.